Welcome to the Inspiration North podcast, inspiring stories from inspirational people and how they found their passion, their true north. I'm James Eaves. And I'm Michelle Minikin. And this is the Inspiration North podcast. Today's episode, Your Imagination is Your Limit with Laura Perry. We talk about having the job of her dreams, quite possibly the best job in the world, her guiding principle of only ever doing things that are fun, and how she probably has some elf DNA. Having worked as a professional Christmas decorator since 2013, and with more than 13 years experience in the wider events industry, Laura is the youngest sole director of a Christmas decorating company in the UK. She's half Geordie, but Yorkshire born and raised, a proud northerner who happens to work all over the UK and sometimes the world. Team Festive is just over two years old and has been growing exclusively through word of mouth from wonderfully loyal clients who have now become friends. It is the only independent Christmas decorating company located between Edinburgh and York, so the team covers a large part of northern England and the Scottish borders. Keen on adventure sports away from Christmas time, Laura can be usually found climbing mountains, skiing down them, or falling out of planes. Did you know what you wanted to be when you were grown up? No, I didn't. And I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. When am I going to grow up? I'm not sure. <laughs> I, think, I think it's optional. Yeah. No, I think when I was a kid, um, I went to a nice primary school, but a pretty rough secondary school. Mm-hmm. And um, there was a lot of bullying around. It was mm-hmm. pretty rife. I don't know if that's still the same these days, but it was then. Mm. And um, I just wanted to be normal, you know? Like, if you're being bullied, you just don't want to stick out. You just want to be middle of the road, nothing unusual about me. Mm. Just nobody noticed me is kind of what you wanted to be. So from there, as a teenager, to being a professional Christmas decorator, where you very much stick out in pub conversation <laughs> mm-hmm. and wherever wherever else you go uh, has been a, a long journey so yeah I was quite a shy kid couldn't answer the phone at home couldn't really talk to strangers totally different person than I was a decade and a half ago yeah you wouldn't ever be described as shy now I don't know I, I feel shy I mm-hmm. inside I feel shy like I do feel that it's easy talking to a couple of people in a room mm-hmm. but if you were to put me as I have been put on a stage in front of hundreds of shareholders, I've done that before, you know, mm-hmm. that's really intimidating and something that I've now got a process for preparing for, mm-hmm. uh, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, does. Um, and the process is quite unusual. Um, it inv- involves like a lot of crying beforehand <laughs> to get the stress <laughs> out, you know. I think crying is good. It makes me feel good anyway. Yeah. I've learned to deal with the situations that put you in front of people, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. which has happened a lot. If you're a leader, but you're a shy person naturally mm-hmm. you p- you're put into leadership positions that you have to deal with and mm-hmm. so you just have to find ways of dealing with them some things that now have become natural and i'm okay with it mm-hmm. other things i am still working on and will probably still be working on for decades you know yeah that's fascinating so you were at school trying so hard to not be unusual not you know, stay in the middle be average mm. mm-hmm. so that the bullies didn't pick you out so what what did you do after school? Well, I got to move schools. My my school finishes at 16, so after your GCSEs. Mm. Yeah. So it's almost like some people go to school till they're 18, mm-hmm. same school, you know, from when they're 10 or 11. Mm-hmm. Or if they've got a middle school, you know, they've been in school a lot a lot longer and it includes their sixth form yeah. or college. Um, but because I had to move at 16, gave me an interesting moment to sort of reinvent myself mm-hmm. where I went to a sixth form with only three people out of my year group of 350 from my old school. So Mm -hmm. only those three people knew me and it was okay because they were nice people. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of like you get into this, you know, a lot of people have been filtered out where they're not going to continue. You didn't have to continue education to 18 at the time. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people didn't continue after GCSEs. A lot of people from my school didn't. Mm -hmm. So it was almost like you kind of had this fresh start with a whole new set of new friends. Mm -hmm. They've got whole different worldviews. They come from a different part of the city that you'd never even been to before. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it was the first time I came across people who lived in mansion houses, like huge, I mean, vast sort of places that I'd never seen before, Mm -hmm. which I thought was amazing. Um, And it sort of starts to expand your horizons that little bit more Mm -hmm. than the 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 one square mile where you live. Mm -hmm. That's where I'd been. Yep. for all my life until 
going to sixth form, which was a two-hour bus journey away to get to every day. Oh, wow. And you start learning about hard work because you're commuting an hour into the city centre and then an hour back out again. Mm-hmm. As a 16-year-old, 17-year-old, that is just a 20-minute drive from your house. Mm-hmm. So mentally, every morning, you are thinking, I just need my driving license, I need my driving license, I need my driving license, because this would allow me to have an hour and a half in the morning Mm -hmm. and an hour and a half in the evening extra time off of public transport. Mm. So as much as I loved the buses and they were good value for money, getting a small car and being able to drive to school was kind of a priority Mm -hmm. to try and make that experience easier. And then while I was at sixth form, I've always had part-time jobs, Mm -hmm. so you started out waitressing Mm -hmm. you work really hard as a waitress and when you turn 18 you're kind of like you know to the manager when can i start on the bar when can i start on the bar when can i start on the bar (laughs) you know the fun the fun bit the 18 year old bit yeah so you go from being a waitress to being a a barmaid and then you you realize that you can sell 25 quid measures of whiskey quite easily to stag parties and things and the manager's like you can stay on the bar and you're like yes great because this is better than (laughs) what i was in before (laughs) <laughs> and then once you've got your first bar job you can then kind of go and work apply for your next bar job and kind of work in any pub so mm-hmm. then I went on to work for yeah famous restaurant chains um and and the tips and stuff so that was kind of like the sixth form happening mm-hmm. where I was doing chemistry physics biology maths playing musical you're... instruments <laughs> playing sport captain the <laughs> hockey team yeah. so I kind of kept myself really really busy mm. partying hard because mm-hmm. you turn 18 and all of a sudden you're like mm-hmm. oh you know, the city centre is open to me and I've got the driving licence to prove it, you mm. know. So you start kind of, you know, exploring the city centre and growing up and hanging out with your friends and being sort of, I felt like being a teenager, really, with freedom for the first time. Mm-hmm. Um, passed my driving test after four months. Lots of minors, but first time, yeah. fine. That was all that mattered. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> pass is a pass. Is goal a- is a goal, you know, just <laughs> fine. <laughs> um, and so then... I suppose hard work started then because when I could drive, I had the time for part-time jobs. Part-time jobs gives you the money to go and have fun and buy clothes. Mm -hmm. And my parents had a a policy of from when we were 10, Mm -hmm. you get pocket money, but you have to buy all your own clothes and all your own things with that. So huge responsibility, responsibility actually. Yeah, I never really thought about it at the time. I was just like, yes, give me money. Mm. But then when you go, oh, a pair of jeans is 20 quid. Mm -hmm. That's going to take me like two months to save up for. Mm. But I need a pair of jeans now. So you're kind of like, how can I do this? And then you're just like saving and saving your pocket money constantly just to try and afford things. Mm. And then you're going shopping and you're like, oh, yeah, I want those, you know, brand name jeans. But you're like, uh, but that's six months to save up, yeah. whereas these ones from this little shop down the road are yeah. two months to save up. Oh, mm-hmm. I can buy those ones then, because mm-hmm. then I can get another pair. Mm-hmm. Do you know? You see, you start learning the value of money. I mm-hmm. suppose was kind of quite a young, a young thing for me as well. So the part-time jobs helped me, having had that money sort of monetary education, mm-hmm. use that to to save sensibly. And then, as soon as I turned eighteen, finished my A levels, um, didn't know what I wanted to do when I grew up you know Mm -hmm. definitely didn't know then (laughs) and um decided that I wanted to go traveling so that was the one thing I was certain of was that I wanted to as soon as I'd finished the sort of free education I was entitled to Mm. was to disappear I wanted to go and you know I'd been on holidays Mm. we went to Wales a lot as kids Mm -hmm. so that's another culture another language we used to drive for five hours in the car it's very long to get there Mm -hmm. but um, and then when we were teenagers, I didn't have a passport till I was 12. So um, some people had passports when they were four and five, you know, mm-hmm. but we went mm-hmm. through it. I remember going through my first passport, mm-hmm. you know, getting your GP to sign the, the photo oh, and yes. things, you know, because no one else could identify you. So <laughs> after a couple of holidays to Florida and sort of the usual places, but nowhere that really doesn't speak English, you know, yeah. that was kind of... Uh, they were our family holidays. Mm-hmm. We went to Egypt a couple of times to go scuba diving, mm-hmm. um, which was just a passion of my dad's. Mm-hmm. And he sort of took the whole family with him and we were all happy to go along. So there's some people in the family just want to sit on the beach. Brilliant. Fine. But he chose Egypt um, as the location that we sort of went back to a couple of times. Mm-hmm. And then when I was sort of 16 on that family holiday, I remember saying to the dive center manager, like, can I come and work here? You know, can I just like mop up or something? Or is there anything I can do just to earn my keep and be here? Because mm. I didn't know anywhere else, you know. I didn't really know anyone in Florida or, yes. or Wales. Well, I knew people in Wales, but, you know, I wanted to sort of see the world a little bit. And some sunshine. And some sunshine, yeah. <laughs> Endless sunshine in Egypt, yeah. it really is. 
And it was a fascinating culture, really nice people. Mm-hmm. Uh, I felt at home there, mm-hmm. even though I'd only been a few times on holiday. Um, it's very different when you live there. Um, and so when I turned, well, I was actually just 19 mm-hmm. because I was old in my year group, born in September. I bought a one-way ticket to Egypt and I was like, this is it. This is it. One direction, away from home. Mm-hmm. <laughs> going to go and find myself. You know, I didn't know what I was going to do, but I hadn't, hadn't applied to university. and I was just thinking, this is it. This is my life now. Sounds like a great, so- a great name for a song. One way ticket mm. to Egypt. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> first, first life-changing moment, I mm-hmm. think. And then um, I worked as a dive master while I was out there. So a pro- mm-hmm. professional diving role uh, before I became an instructor months later. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so you're working in the industry. You work in the tourist industry. There's a lot of big holiday brands were bringing their, their customers out who'd paid lots of money. Mm-hmm. And I was taking them on snorkeling trips and diving holidays and all mm. sorts of really amazing things and i was like i can't believe i'm earning the equivalent of 12 english pounds a day <laughs> and each person here has paid 70 quid to be on this boat yeah. you know the money and <laughs> the money disparity was vast mm. um and i learned a lot about inequality mm. while i was out there because i was an english girl out there speaking english as a first language was the reason was given from the dive center mm-hmm. i earned more money than the e- Egyptian person doing exactly mm. the same role as me. Mm. And I remember going to the dive center manager when I realized this after the first week and saying, why am I getting paid more than the guys that I'm working with? Because I'm on a boat full of six local guys mm-hmm. who are from Egypt and this is their country. Yep. And I'm working here on more money, but they are better at the job than me. So I don't feel like I'm carrying the team. I feel like the team is carrying me. Why should I earn more? And he said, because you speak English as a first language and the guests appreciate that. Mm. I was like, that's great that the guests appreciate that, but I think we should all be earning the same. And he's like, well, I'm not willing to increase their wage to match yours. And I was like, so reduce my wage to match theirs. Mm. If that works for you, it works for me, but I want to be a team member. Mm -hmm. And the only way I can be part of that team is to be able to tell them that we earn the same Mm. because they'll Mm. resent me if if I don't. And so he was like, I have never had anybody ask me to lower their wages (laughs) before. (laughs) But I am more than happy to do that. If that's really what you want, please think carefully about it. And I was like, I've already thought about this. The reason I'm here is because I want to earn the same. Mm -hmm. Either way, I want to earn the same as them. Mm. And he said, fine. So he reduced my wages. And so that's why I was on 12 English pounds a day, which you can't afford to live on. Mm. If you're not a local who speaks the language, Mm. you know, you go to the market and you might pay twice as much or three times as much. Mm -hmm because you don't speak Arabic. Mm -hmm. So I had to make friends with people who were Egyptian to go to the market for me Mm -hmm. to help me get the right prices for things so that they could say, no, no, she's all right. You know, she's one of us. (laughs) And then I would pay their prices (laughs) because, you know, they know that you're on more money if you're working there. So really, really interesting Mm. sort of, yeah, inequalities that I witnessed. And it was whilst they were under um, a regime. They weren't Mm -hmm. a free country. Mm -hmm. The revolution hadn't happened. It was before that. Mm-hmm. You got to see oppression uh, of like local people, mm-hmm. and as a as a teenager, that massively affects you. Mm. So I heard a really good phrase the other day, which was, um, "Travel is good for the compost heap, and travel when you're young is really good for the compost heap." Mm. And I think that probably was because um, if you experienced that something that you take for granted, where you grow up is not a right in another country Mm -hmm. and you can't do anything about it because Mm. it's state power it's Mm -hmm. institutionalized Mm -hmm. uh, or it's cultural or whatever the problem is um you you kind of can't believe it and you realize that the world isn't all like your world yeah so that's the sort of wider horizons how fortunate you are and yeah what you've had back at home is not quite as bad as you think it is as a 16 year old no, when I got home, my dad tricked me into coming home for Christmas that mm-hmm. year. He bought Treat. me a... Yeah, tricked me. <laughs> bought a one-way flight. He said, oh, I'll pay for you to come back. And I was like, yeah, because I was like, on £12 a day, I can't afford to buy a flight for a year, you know? Mm. And he's like, but we want to see you at Christmas. And I was like, well, I'm not coming home. I'm staying here. I can't afford it. It's not happening. Yep. So dad was like, I'll buy you the flight. You know, it was only 130 quid or something, but I just couldn't, mm. couldn't afford it. So mm. he bought the flight. And when I was home for Christmas, uh, I was like, right, Dad, you know, uh, my stuff's still out there. I need to get back to work, you know. And he was like, well, you better pay for a flight back then, hadn't you? And I was like, no, like, (laughs) 
I don't have the money to get back. And then he was, I was like, you know, straight on the phone to the restaurants and bars I'd worked in, you know, can I get some shifts over the new year? Like mm-hmm. quick, get some money in, mm-hmm. buy my flight back. And um, so, yeah, so I bought my flight back. I got back there in the March, so it took me a while, but I decided to sort of save up a little bit and have a bit more mm-hmm. behind me to go mm-hmm. back with. Yeah. So I stayed a bit longer, mm-hmm. apologized to the dive center and said, I will come back. But it was quiet season anyway. Mm. So if they've got staff who don't want to be there for quiet season, they're kind of like, it's okay, it's fine, it's yeah. cold, it's January, February time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Come back in March, fine. Mm-hmm. So they were happy with it. So yeah, went back out there in March. Those months I spent in Egypt of that year also included my first near-death experience. Mm-hmm. The first moment where I thought, I am going to die. Mm. And that's like, I'm, it, it was just a reality of the situation I found myself in. It was a, a sort of dive, a scuba dive that was going to go wrong and managed to not go wrong Mm -hmm. Um, when you're professional and you work in the industry you push the boundaries you push the limits Mm -hmm. you start being you start operating in sort of an extreme capacity compared Mm -hmm. to someone who just goes out there for a holiday because you've Mm -hmm. done you've done their holiday dives thousands of times so what more is there you know so Mm -hmm. you kind of go to push the limits a little bit and so that experience as well was a bit like wow like I feel alive I feel really alive you feel really like okay, what am I going to do with my life? I need some purpose. You start thinking, why am I just swimming around, you know, (laughs) the Red Sea? You know, this is great, (laughs) but what am I going to do with my life? Mm -hmm. And um, I said to the dive centre manager, it was actually before I'd gone home for Christmas, but I said to the dive centre manager, I want your job. Mm -hmm. Bit bit ballsy, bit... uh, it's a bit much probably for him to hear, you know, this teenager <laughs> saying they want your job. But, um, I, that's what I said to him. I said, not now, you know, but in the future, I want to run a dive center because that's the most senior position I can see happening here. Mm-hmm. And I could do it. I really think I'm capable of running a dive center. I'd love it. That would be amazing. Mm-hmm. What a great life. And he said, oh, you can't. And I was like, why can't I? Not, not the fact that you're here. But I mean, like, why can't I run a dive center? And he's like, oh, because you haven't been to university. Good. And I was like, oh. <laughs> It's a very practical role and, and mm-hmm. you know, I'm a good dive master. I'm going to become a good instructor. Like, why can't I run the dive center? You know, I'm sure I could do that. He's like, nope, not possible. You have to have a university degree to be able to run a dive center. It will never happen. Not in this group of companies and it w- won't happen. You need to go and get a, a university degree. And I was like, oh, no, I haven't applied to university. And I was <laughs> just thinking, how, like, the deadline's in, like, a week. You know, the end of January was, like, the deadline to get. And I was like, I've got to apply to university. I just need to apply. Like, if I want to be a dive center manager, I need to go to university. <laughs> so he'd convinced me of this. Yeah. And so... He, and he cahoots with your dad, by the way. I have no idea. <laughs> he, my dad was in touch with the managers because <laughs> I left my phone in a taxi once while I was out there and I just didn't bother getting another mobile phone for a month. Mm. And so my, my parents were concerned. So they phoned work one time and in the staff briefing in the morning, it was, Laura, please phone your parents. <laughs> you know, and I was like, oh, sorry, I will do. <laughs> Let's use the office phone to phone home and say I'm alive, you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he convinced me that going to university was how to sort of get on in life, but yeah. tricked me a little bit by mm. saying that's how I could become a dive centre manager. Interesting. So I was like, oh, I'll pick a degree that's, you know, close to diving. Mm. So it's marine biology or biology. And I was like, oh, biology is a bit more broad. I'll do biology because then, mm-hmm. you know, I've got the marine and the biology and I can mm-hmm. do all of it. Mm-hmm. so that's why I was kind of like right okay fine so I, five days I put a university application together frantically phoned my sixth form and said you need to write a reference for me yesterday mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> sorry I um, wrote a personal statement about how passionate I was about um you know marine life in particular but also like just life in general and why I wanted to study biology um and then sent it off and then you don't hear anything for months you know it takes mm. a while to accept it or reject it yes apart from of the six universities I applied to two rejected me instantly so that was like i suppressed submit at 11 58 it nope. probably processes at 11 59 which was the deadline at midnight mm-hmm. and by two minutes past midnight you know i had rejections from places like manchester and a few another university mm-hmm. and i was like wow like they definitely didn't read my application mm. that's a bit mean <laughs> like how much work you've put into that and mm. They've mm-hmm. auto-rejected it, and they've not even been subtle about it and put a 10-hour delay on it. They've just, two minutes later, mm. rejected. Sorry, you're not our candidate. And I was like, wow, like, if they've rejected me, and this is a kind of a standpoint that I've taken throughout my life, really. If somebody isn't willing to get to know you and reject you, they're not somebody you wanted to work with anyway, mm. or they're not an institution you wanted to go to, go to. Yes. So I kind of made that a firm decision really for the future was if somebody doesn't take the time to find out about you mm-hmm. 
they're not somebody you wanted to be involved in with anyway. Mm. And that was the first time I was like really rejected from something mm-hmm. that you wanted, you know, really, really wanted. So thankfully. What about the other four then? A couple of, uh, couple of unconditional offers and a, right. and a conditional one as well. Mm-hmm. One of the conditionals was you have to go back and redo your physics. And I was like, nah. <laughs> no chance. That was really <laughs> tough subject, um, which mm. was really interesting at the time. Yeah. But if you imagine having had six months out of academia and education yeah. and the world of work, and you've got to think about going back into all those theories, mm. I was like, I don't, I'm not actually convinced I'd get a better grade. Mm-hmm. So I was thinking, nah, you know, no, it's okay. Do you know what? So the choice was Newcastle and Nottingham mm-hmm. universities, unconditional offers yeah. for biology. And didn't mind. Uh, Nottingham was 45 minutes from my hometown of Sheffield. Newcastle's two and a half hours. Probably nice to be a bit further away so mum and dad can't <laughs> stop by with the washing. <laughs> or I don't know. You know, I was kind of thinking closer or further, closer or further. And then I was like, actually, what's most important to me is that I play hockey. Mm-hmm. That's how I keep fit. Mm-hmm. And I was really missing it because they don't, they don't play hockey in Egypt. So I was really missing my sport. I missed that kind of exercise. Mm-hmm missed the team you know aspects of it and I thought when I get to university I definitely want to play hockey and it'd be great to represent whatever university I'm in yep. so I looked at the leagues that their hockey teams were in and mm-hmm. sort of what level of hockey yep. that I could perhaps play in mm. but wanted to give myself a second or a first team to be able to get promoted into and become a better player whilst I was at university mm-hmm. if you're playing four times a week with the same team over and over you're going to become a much better yeah. player. Mm. So you don't want to have, you don't want to go straight in at the first team. Mm-hmm. You want some space to be able to grow mm-hmm. in your sport. And they were both pretty much in the same leagues. And I was kind of like, oh, I could grow in both of those. So I was really like, these are really 50-50, these, uh, these universities. I'm not sure. Mm. I'd never been to either city or either university. Mm. So I was like, well, uh, you know, let's let's get some on some open days in the summer. Um, but I wanted to sort of make my selection as quick as I could I didn't want to lose that opportunity you want to just go yes approved give me that one because unconditional you have to reject all other universities so you can't go I want this one and a backup you have to I want this one and I reject all others Mm. which felt a bit final you know Mm -hmm. so I really quickly sort of called up a few people who were going to be in the year above me and had been from my school and said oh hey I realize you've been to this university can I come and visit for the afternoon I just want to see the city and can you tell me about it mm-hmm. so uh, I didn't have many friends at Nottingham so I just kind of went with a friend to Nottingham and we saw the campus okay. she was looking for, to apply that year mm-hmm. so we did a sort of open day there and then in Newcastle I turned up on the train I had four hours in the city um, and just had to quickly meet up with my friend he took me around the campus and I was like "Ooh, nice buildings Ooh, you know nice surroundings but because it was somebody giving you the inside track it wasn't just an open day where there's yes. thousands of the people. Paint mm. the best picture. and Well, it paints a realistic picture. Yeah. You know, he was more like, mm. oh, that whole residence is no good, but that one's amazing. Mm-hmm. Do you know? And so I was like, oh, great. Mm. I've got some guidance on where I could live. Mm. And by the time you're making that second choice of where am I living, yeah. you've already decided to come to a city. Mm. So it felt like that. Mm-hmm. So after sort of four hours here, he dropped me off back at the train station, caught the train home. And it helped that he was from a hockey club back home. So that was like, mm. he was talking about the hockey club and how nice the people were and mm. yeah, you know, you'll be fine. Yeah, you'll yep. fit in. You've got the ability to play here. Mm-hmm. So it was almost like there was more certainty about Newcastle. Mm-hmm. But I still went home and thought, well, again, don't mind between the two of them. Flipped a 50, 50 pence piece coin. Mm-hmm. And I was like, heads is like mm-hmm. the top, right? So that can be Newcastle. Mm-hmm. And tails is at the bottom. So that can be Nottingham. And it landed on heads. And I was like, yeah, great, great. So I <laughs> logged onto my Newcastle account, <laughs> accepted Newcastle and rejected all others. Okay. And that brought me to the northeast, which mm-hmm. was nice in another way because um, my dad's a Geordie. Mm-hmm. He's a sand dancer from South Shields. Mm-hmm. And I still had a uh, family up here, so his aunt and uncle and a few other people mm-hmm. uh, who were getting on a little bit. And it was nice to sort of be closer to them. So I had no family in Nottingham. So, mm-hmm. you know, it, it kind of made more sense mm-hmm. as well to come back to the northeast. But um, you let the universe decide anyway. Yeah, I just, I'm <laughs> quite a believer in fate, you know. It's, <laughs> it's okay, you know, you're going to have a university experience at, at some university. And those two are both Russell Group universities, you know, it was quite, a, I had mm-hmm. good choices available to me. So mm. I was fortunate in that, in that respect. So yeah, came to Newcastle. And that was uh, 12 years ago now. Haven't managed to leave yet. <laughs> so <laughs> it was a good choice, I think. So then you go through university and the course is fantastic. 
biology is a really interesting subject. Um, it's the science of life. So mm. you can study anything and, you know, you can learn about birds or bees or plants or animals or marine life or mm-hmm. humans, you know, whatever you want to learn about. So really varied, interesting course. It's not so theoretical. It's not so deep. You know, there's a bit of statistics and some other things, but it's a really varied, interesting course. So I think... If anyone was going to go to university, you'd want to do something that you're passionate about and that you enjoy. Mm. And so I'm f- very fortunate mm. that I happened to have chosen a subject that was mm. both those things for me. Um, so I had a tough time at university. It wasn't all plain sailing. It's a very stressful time. Mm-hmm. Took on lots of voluntary roles. So became a committee member of the hockey club. You know, started mm-hmm. volunteering. Um, there's a lot of volunteering opportunities available mm. um, to help you grow as a person outside of your course. So the extracurricular stuff was really a priority Mm -hmm. um, for me. Towards the end of university, I was thinking, I've had a great time, but I've also, the university hasn't necessarily supported me in some ways when it could have been better. Um, So it is a great university, brilliant university, um, but it could always be better, Mm. you know? And there's things that you kind of feel that you could contribute to. I I could tell this story and I could go and represent people and say, Mm. yes, you're an amazing university, but here's how you can be better. And really push the university to keep going. Mm. So towards the end of my degree, I decided to apply to be president of the student union in the student elections. Mm-hmm. And that was terrifying. That's like 20,000 people that you're putting yourself in front of <laughs> as a shy kid mm-hmm. for rejection. You know, and that was in my head. I was like, God, imagine getting rejected by 20,000 people as a 23 year old. Yeah, that's going to be a bit of a that's going to be tough to deal with. Mm. That was kind of my mindset mm-hmm. going into the election. I was thinking, you know, I don't know how I'm going to win this. There's a field of seven candidates, six guys and then me. And all the candidates pick a T-shirt colour, you know, to run around campus in and put posters up in mm-hmm. all the respective colours. And by the time I got to the little candidate sort of get together where they were sort of picking colours and they'd all the primary colours had gone. I was like, well, what colours are left? And they were like, oh, you could do a combination. You know, I'm having white and purple because there's no other colours left. And I was like, mm-hmm. oh, is pink left Mm -hmm. let's go fuchsia you know let's go really (laughs) really bright pink because i just thought you need a color that stands out you know the field of candidates so Mm -hmm. let's go for that so you make posters you design posters you try and do i did a targeted campaign and i think i was one of the first candidates in their elections to use um, like social networking adverts as part of the budget Mm -hmm. which then got to ten thousand, you know people without me having to put a poster in their respective school Mm -hmm. study Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that kind of changed the way their elections happened. And it's funny how the things that you see in student politics Mm -hmm. tend to transpire into grown-up politics about 10 years later. Mm -hmm. So, oh, Mm -hmm. what impact is social media having on elections these days? And it's all the same discussions are happening now that I have already been through Mm. 10 years ago, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, that was happening (laughs) in that sort of student union environment. Mm -hmm. So um, fascinating experience. And I only won the election by 16 votes. Oh, wow. Close. In an alternative vote system mm. where I had lost in the first round as well. So as you as they announce the votes, you think you've lost. Mm-hmm. And then you come back because you get people's second preference votes. Mm-hmm. Right, yes. And then eventually, you know, there's two of you left in and somebody's votes are there left to be redistributed. And you've no oh. idea who... You, 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 you're these people's fourth and fifth place choice out of these candidates and they are the ones deciding between these two close runners Brilliant. who becomes the next president and <laughs> it was really really tight you're the last ballot being called because it's the president you mm. know and unbelievable mm. unbelievable I'm, I remember just thinking mm, maybe that's fate <laughs> yeah, I didn't know what it was you know I was just kind of like well I put my trust in it but then I'd done the I'd done the hard miles you know I'd, I'd been out you know on the last morning of campaigning giving people stickers to say i've run out of flyers but please take a sticker it's the last two hours of voting please vote for me Mm -hmm. when no other candidates were around you know Mm. Mm. so i really did want that role um so to win it was was a fantastic thing and it was probably life-changing moment number two Mm -hmm. after sort of leaving home going abroad doing the traveling you know winning that election um representing twenty thousand people um you represent their opinion to the university you sit on the board of the university which is the university council. Mm-hmm. And that university turns over hundreds of millions of pounds. Mm-hmm. So you, you've got a financial director reporting to you with Ks at the top of the column. Mm-hmm. You know, and you're kind of thinking, this is mm. an incredible experience. You also chair the trustee board, 
of the student union, mm-hmm. which is also, it turns over more than a million pounds in Newcastle. So you're running legally mm-hmm. responsible for a charitable organization, mm. strategically. Mm-hmm. So, you know, given the guidance of the staff and the university and, you know, your fellow sabbatical officers, um, you we wrote a three-year strategic plan for the organization. Mm-hmm. And then after we'd kind of done six months of our term in office, mm-hmm. um, they're like, right, you need to, we need to recruit the next people. And you're like, no, like I've only just got the hang of this role. Like mm. I've just figured it out. <laughs> so I tried to quietly not tell anybody I would rerun, but recruit people to run in the ballot. Um, but then at the last minute, put my name in to rerun because I didn't hear of anybody else going for it. <laughs> it's like the goblet of fire. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> it's just um, <laughs> tricky, tricky times, but won that election by only 56 votes mm-hmm. out of thousands, you know. Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, it's fate again. I don't know. Mm-hmm. But okay. And I didn't campaign. I don't think it was fair for an incumbent to campaign. Mm-hmm. So I let the candidates go out, put their posters. I didn't put a single poster up. I just said, mm-hmm. here's my manifesto. You read it in the student newspaper. You know what I'm about. And I've yep. done a year. Mm-hmm. This or they mm-hmm. will campaign and try to win your vote. Mm-hmm. So that was, I knew it would be close. And mm-hmm. I knew I might not win it. But I thought, if people want an incumbent, they'll choose the incumbent. So, yeah. two years of that. <laughs> so then, in your second year as a sabbatical, you get a lot more opportunities to work nationally. Mm-hmm. There's a, a sort of consortium, a purchasing consortium that a lot of students in the country buy their uh, shop goods and their alcohol and things through. Mm. I ended up putting myself forward to be a shareholder representative. All the student unions are shareholders. Mm-hmm. Put myself forward to be a shareholder representative on behalf of student unions, and they elect five a year to sit on the board. Mm-hmm. So out of 15 candidates, I managed to get elected as one of these five to the board yeah. as a effectively a non-executive director <laughs> of a company turning over hundreds of millions of pounds, mm-hmm. which you're kind of like, how does this, how did this happen? <laughs> but okay, I've, you know, got over my fear of public speaking, have a process to deal with that, delivered a speech to the shareholders mm-hmm. about Haribo, which was quite, <laughs> quite memorable. <laughs> And yeah, got elected. And then once you're on the board, um, you take a role on a subcommittee. Mm -hmm. And so I was, you know, everyone takes all the fun stuff, you know, like what committees are there? Well, there's one for sorting out projects and that's going to be really exciting this year. And that's the main focus. Mm. And then the the sort of last one that was left was a finances and resources committee. Mm -hmm. I was like, I'm just gonna put my hands up saying I'm happy to go and chair that subcommittee. But I know nothing about finance or resources. Mm -hmm. I've never had any business training. I've never been you know i've never had any kind of education in this area I, I know nothing about it i will go and be a chairperson and chair a meeting but that is the extent of my expertise that i could bring to that committee and they mm-hmm. said oh great that's fine brilliant that's all you need to do non-executive just go and represent and yep. be the student voice on that committee mm-hmm. so there i'm sat you know in this finance and resources committee and um it was around the time when there was lots of pension problems mm-hmm. the cost of pension yep. products were there was a problem with them there were gaps in finances and you know that group of companies was no no different you know it's still having we need to put more in the pension pot type mm. problems so i spent the year learning about pensions which is totally you know i'd never it's very different isn't it? Mm, yeah it's not what you expect as a student representative no. you know it's not wasn't really on my radar um but yeah i had some fantastic experiences where the russell group universities had a group called the Aldrich Group, which was the student unions of the Russell Group. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's a very little heard of group. I don't think it currently meets, but at the time it was meeting regularly. And so also my second year, um, I was elected to chair the Aldrich Group. of So it's all the presidents and education officers from all the Russell Group student unions in the country. Mm-hmm. And you have a meeting about six times a year at the respective campuses around the country mm-hmm. and effectively you lobby the russell group so you've kind of got the national union of students lobbying government mm-hmm. we are lobbying the russell group because they're quite influential mm-hmm. and there's a there's a there's i think there's a role there for for lobbying that organization mm. and they will only listen to their own student representatives yeah so being chair of all the sort of red brick university student unions for that year as well was another experience mm. you know you're dealing with crises not only in your own institution but you're helping mm. other presidents and people mm-hmm. deal with theirs makes sense um so talking a lot of sort of senior roles whilst we were delivering year one of our strategic plan for the charity back on campus in a day-to-day capacity. so did you have any time to study 
<laughs> well, no. So this is a it's a year out. You get to oh, I see. It's a like yeah, placement. It's a paid role. Yeah, you mentioned that. Yes. Yeah. So because you've got a salary, you're still a student. But you're paid. And was part of that, did you have to do some form of uh, coursework or assignments or? No, nothing. Not even that. No, it's right. just the status of being a student because you're still a student mm. representative. Okay. Um, so in the Education Act, you were allowed to be a SFATC officer of a student union mm -hmm. only for two years following the conclusion of your studies. Okay. So two years is your maximum. Got it. So even if people wanted to re-elect you again, they couldn't. Like it's not, it's not allowed. It makes it, yeah. So it's like you get. Otherwise you'd have. Otherwise you'd be really old, and you could represent people. Forty-five who year olds. Yeah, you'd probably be <laughs> out of touch a little bit. Mm. So, um, and I think playing hockey whilst I was in those two years, mm -hmm. um, still as a student to represent the university, was the thing that kept me in touch with the student population. Yep. You know, you get to um, speak to mm. students who are not heavily involved in student politics on a weekly basis, and say yep. to them this is the thing we're thinking of doing, mm -hmm. you know, at training right. with my mates on the pitch. Mm -hmm. And they'd sort of roll their eyes and be like, oh, Laura's asking something else about, you know, <laughs> the student union. <laughs> but I genuinely wanted their opinions on things because mm. they were a sort of nice sounding board yeah, you get for the, ideas. And the, the, f uh, the frank feedback, weren't mm -hmm. you? Yeah. From people that know you, trust you. Because they could shrug and just say, nobody cares about that, Laura. Yes. And I'd be like, oh, okay. It's good to know. Good to know. Otherwise then I will make a leadership decision and mm. represent them on their behalf. Mm -hmm. Whereas if they came back to me and said, oh, actually, we've got really strong opinions on that, or there was a difference in opinion in the team and someone mm. debated it, you get sort of changing room debates about stuff, you know, that yep. was actually really important for my work. Mm -hmm. But they didn't mind me, you know, chucking that into conversation. Hmm. What was it, do you think, that made you go for those roles? If it's, if you, you sort of have said you, you're quite shy and mm. retiring from school age, you've try to not stick out to avoid the bullies whereas these are representing 20,000 people representing shareholders what is it then that's led you to consciously apply for stuff like this um I think the final answer to that is that I felt like I was the best person for the role mm -hmm. and other people told me as such yeah so okay. I wouldn't have gone for them if people hadn't said I think you'd be really good at that okay you know, somebody sort of nudging mm. you over the line and saying, you're in the best position to take those roles. And I think it was chance that I was in that position to be nudged mm -hmm. because I had taken a voluntary role on the hockey committee mm. because I was passionate about hockey. Okay. There's no, I want to be a mm. student representative in the future in my mind. Right. It's just, I can run the hockey club better than this current committee, so mm -hmm. I'll go for a, a mm -hmm. committee role. Mm. And I did one that was behind the scenes. It wasn't a, I wasn't president of the hockey club. I was secretary. So it's just all the admin. A thankless task mm -hmm. <laughs> to this day. If you're organizing fixtures for a sports team, I feel your pain because <laughs> it is a thankless task. You just get stuff wrong and that's the only time people notice is when the no umpire turns up for the game mm -hmm. or there's no food after the match. Mm. Yeah. And I was responsible for, you know, all the umpires mm. um, for matches booked twice a week. It was 125 matches that I organised during mm. my second year at university for my teammates, That's including awesome. umpires and pitchers and mm. food. Like it was, it was a huge sort of admin task. Yeah. Mm. And you get a bottle of bubbly at the end of the year. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> well done. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> you know, so it was, yeah, it was, um, it was an interesting role. Mm. Um, from that, um, the way that student representation set up at, at the university was... Um, Every year they elect seven representatives from the 55 sports clubs mm -hmm. to sit on the student council. Mm -hmm. And so I was kind of looking at that going, oh, I could represent all the sports clubs, not just the hockey club. Mm -hmm. So I had, you know, in my second year, I had mm. applied to that role, okay. stood up and done a, a, you know, this is a second year student. I did mm -hmm. a speech in front of these. I was terrified. Mm -hmm. It was luckily it was one of the uh, hockey boys who had been elected to be the mm -hmm athletic union officer for that year the sabbatical role yep. so he had said i don't have anyone for this particular role it's the it's the finance role mm -hmm. you don't actually have to do any finance please just join the committee mm. i just need to fill the role <laughs> some of the some of the positions like the deputy AU officer are competitive mm. some of them they never get filled maybe because people don't feel like they have the skills for it you yep. know and it's mm -hmm. that's a big budget as well well at the time it felt like a big budget it was mm. sort of a 50 50 grand budget 100 grand budget mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. i was like oh i don't want to be responsible for that but yeah. he was like just just stand up do the speech, I promise you it'll be fine, you'll get elected. Mm -hmm. So it was a kind of a who you know type situation mm. for that one moment. And I was like, well, if he hadn't nudged me 
into that position, yeah. I probably wouldn't have taken that role. Because mm. mm. I would have been too shy and I'd have just sat there and voted for the people. Yes. On behalf of our club. So at that AGM, you know, you're then representing all the sports clubs. So from then all the sports clubs, the seven people on that committee, two people sit on the student council mm -hmm. to represent the sports clubs mm -hmm. each month. But you can rotate those two roles around the seven people. Okay. Only very few of the other seven wanted to go to the student council meeting, mm. you know, every month. Yeah. On top of all the other stuff we were doing, mm. you know, committee mm -hmm. positions. And these people are highly gifting of their time. Mm -hmm. And so another two or three hours a month was probably just a bit much. Mm -hmm. So I was yeah. like, I'll do it. You know, I'll just put my hand up and say, <laughs> I'll go. And so I kind of ended up being that one of those people who went to the student council. Mm. So then you find out about how debates work. And you see people who are really confident. And I sat on the student council for three years representing the sports clubs because I got re-elected to that committee each year. Mm -hmm. That was at university. And um, then from there went on to represent them at the student council. So yeah. if you sit on the student council for three years, you hear about opportunities like we're recruiting two students to the trustee board. Yeah. And I put my name forward and I got mm. rejected the first time I applied. They mm. didn't think I had enough experience. And I reapplied the next year in my final year of university and they appointed me to the trustee board. So by the time I'm finishing my degree, I've sat on the student council for three years. I've been a member of a sports club and done lots of society activities and volunteering opportunities for four years. Mm -hmm. I've sat on the trustee board for a year and um, run the hockey club. So I was kind of like, I've, I know what it means to be involved in student union activities, mm -hmm. but the student politics side of it is not really my thing. Mm -hmm. That's not what I'm interested in. I just want to make sport better. Mm -hmm. Let's let's make sport and activities and volunteering opportunities like better and more mm -hmm. widely available for students. Mm -hmm. And that was the manifesto I ran on. So... It obviously resonated with quite a few people mm. that they weren't so much bothered about the political debate mm. at that time. Yep. And they were more bothered about how can I get a volunteer opportunity that's going to go on my CV, that's going to make me a better person, mm. help me grow whilst I'm at mm -hmm. university, extracurricular. Mm -hmm. So it's an unusual thing because some people in those elections run on political tickets. Yep. Really? Whereas I was just like... Um, kind of apolitical here just mm -hmm. want to make things better <laughs> is that okay <laughs> if you want that vote for me if you want politics vote for them yep. so some people see it as a sort of career thing I see yeah <clears throat> whereas I didn't see it as a career step I mm. want us to just make a difference yeah so maybe that something that resonates and will affect individual students yeah massively mm. as president of student union I ended up with an amazing business network mm because you're representing students to the city council, mm -hmm. to the light, late night economy in the city yep. centre. Mm -hmm. um, you're lobbying local councillors. Mm. You're lobbying government ministers when they secretly visit the yep. city. Yep. You know, So you are kind of engaged in mm. a sort of wider thing than just your little university world, yep. um, which people don't realise about that role. Mm. So that gave me the confidence then when I found Christmas decorating by chance, that I thought if I was going to start a business, it would be in the Northeast mm -hmm. because I have the support from the business community mm -hmm. and the right network to, to take it, to get it off the ground. Mm. And that's why I ended up staying. I went to London to do a PR internship mm -hmm. straight after being president. And I thought, if I don't sacrifice this career now, I was offered like, you know, graduate role, you know, all the money and stuff mm -hmm. and um, prospects and things, but mm. in a paid role. And I thought, if I don't sacrifice this career now, it's going to be too painful to sacrifice. PR is the kind of thing where you build relationships mm. gradually. Yep. The longer you're in, the better your relationships, the easier your job becomes. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like the first six weeks when you're doing the internship is the hardest moment of PR. You know, where you don't know anybody and you have to mm -hmm. phone them and ask them to mm. publish things for you. Mm -hmm. So I'd done the hard part of that and learning how to promote big companies, FTSE 100 companies and all sorts of people. Um, and I thought, like, now's the time to go and be, you know, if you're going to be a penniless entrepreneur, let's do it mm -hmm. in your mid-20s. Yeah, definitely. Why Christmas trees and Christmas? I've worked in events, the events industry. You know, if you work in bars and restaurants, you end mm -hmm. up in events and you run events mm -hmm. as part of, like, my voluntary roles and fundraising and lots of other things. I've been involved in organising a lot of events. You, you know, occasionally people just say, oh, can you just put those fairy lights up or can you make that look pretty or you saw that area out there's something missing that just mm -hmm. doesn't look quite right or mm. we've got loads of parrots to stick up for this tropical theme can you <laughs> blow the parrots up and stick them up 
it's all little things like that where you learn how to put lights up and how to stick things up and how to make them stay during an event and mm -hmm. the damage that can be done by crowds and things like that and then mm. um i've done a lot of um ski repping so going to the alps take people on their holidays the university trips mm -hmm. so there's a lot of events that happen on people's holidays two or three a week you know bar calls and all sorts of things just organizing things like that was kind of something i'd always done mm. behind the scenes uh, mainly to get free holidays um, <laughs> which is great <laughs> When I found the Christmas decorating idea, I don't know if you've heard of a thing called Stumble Upon. Yes. Amazing mm. little add-on to Firefox. Is it great? It's great. You, you click Stumble Upon mm -hmm. on the browser and it takes you to a page on the internet that you've never been to before that you'll find interesting. Mm -hmm. So if you're a busy person and you don't have time to procrastinate, do not install that <laughs> add-on mm -hmm. <laughs> because it is a wonderful procrastination tool. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what I'd describe it as. Brilliant tool when you are unemployed, feeling a little bit down and want a new idea. Mm -hmm. And so I clicked stumble upon and it came to a blog that was sort of 10 ways to get mums back into work. Mm -hmm. And obviously I wasn't a mum, but I was out of work. So mm -hmm. I read it and I was like, oh, okay, let's see, see what there is. American blog page and number eight, somewhere down the list has become a Christmas decorator. It literally just said it. Brilliant. It wasn't, it was a call to action. You know, <laughs> it was like become a Christmas decorator. It just told me to do it. Mm -hmm. mm. That was it. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, what is this? As if, as if this does is it a exist? thing. Yeah, that's not a thing. It Surely just... not. Surely someone's not paid to do that. Nobody does that. That's not a thing. <laughs> and how ridiculous would that be if that was real, mm. if that was actually a job? Yep. I was like, maybe in America. It's an American blog. <laughs> you know, maybe it's a thing in the US, but mm -hmm. not in the UK. So I read up on it and I just started doing like effectively what would be competitor analysis, seeing American companies, what do they do? And how do they do it? Why do people pay? What kind of people? And you just sort of, I just got really sort of engrossed in the topic and mm. really, really did the research. And this was a couple of weeks before I was leaving Newcastle to go to London for the PR internship. So mm -hmm. I was like, oh God, oh well, backseat, never mind. And then I fired off one email before I went to London that was to a UK based Christmas decorating company. And so while I was doing the PR internship, they responded saying, we're really keen. We really want you to come on board. Can you come for an interview? So that was kind of mm. what made me leave the PR certainty mm -hmm. for part-time job back in the Northeast and, you know, let's start building a Christmas business from scratch. How do you get started then? Is it friends and family? Is it um, you don't have any stock? You no, it was, it was strong. Yeah, no stock. No. No st you start from nothing. It was just negotiating. So that organisation, it was a franchise organisation. Mm. So I wasn't too keen on that. I really just wanted yep. to set my own business up, but... Mm. How do you learn to be a Christmas decorator? Well, you've got to go and pay to be... You've got to go to Christmas decorator training school. And That's that a thing? Felt like my, yeah, I know, is that yeah. at the North Pole? <laughs> yeah, I wish it was. <laughs> Matt planned. If it is, I'm signing up as soon as we finish Crash recording. <laughs> We've lost him. Man <laughs> down, man down. It was cold enough to be. It felt oh. like it, yeah. <laughs> In the workshop, the Christmas workshop. Yeah. Brilliant. So that's where you learn all your floristry skills. Mm. You learn about lighting, you learn about a little bit some sort of electrical skills, you learn you learn some really what I would now consider basic stuff that I can do inside out mm -hmm. back to front. Mm. But at the time I just didn't know about, you know. Mm -hmm. So you they really they really put you through your paces. And there's practicals, you know, you go to towns in the middle of the night and they let you put lights up on shopping centres and, you know, things like that and you have to go and get an an iPath license to drive cherry pickers and big machines and stuff. And you, they mm -hmm. really sort of, you know, it was it was a zero to hero type course, you know, mm -hmm. which was great. Yeah, I, I stayed with them for three years. It mm -hmm. was a good education. And I felt like after three seasons that I got the hang of it. I kind mm -hmm. of knew what I was doing. And I didn't I didn't agree with the ethos. I didn't agree with I don't think we have the same values, mm -hmm. shall we say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I was aware that if we don't have the same values, they're more interested in the profitability of the activity. Mm -hmm. And I was, yes, okay, that's necessary, but I'm more interested in trying to deliver good customer service and build relationships, yeah. mm -hmm. um, knowing my clients and mm -hmm. it being less transactional, mm -hmm. especially something such as personal as, you know, your Christmas decorations. You do some people's table sense pieces for their Christmas meal for their family, you know, yeah. and that's really important to them. Mm. Um, so you want to know really what they like, you know, take the time to get to know them instead of just mm -hmm. trying to get through lots of people. Mm -hmm. So we parted company. And by the time we parted company, I was running the whole of the Northeast and the whole of Scotland for them, mm -hmm. which meant I had a 12 month non-compete clause 
So mm. on paper, I wasn't allowed to be a Christmas decorator for 12 months, yep. which is fine. I signed the agreement, happy to stick to what I'd agreed to do. Mm. But obviously that was quite difficult for my clients because they, they mm. lose you, they lose that relationship and yep. you, you effectively lose every client overnight, mm -hmm. which is, I think, every business person's worst nightmare. Mm -hmm. mm. So mm. it was a difficult time for me and the clients that I had at the time. Um, but I took the 12 months out and I went and did installation work in the events industry for the year. Mm -hmm. Again, built my wider skills, helped me learn how you know other people install for events and mm. then I could um, be better, be a better Christmas decorator yep. with the intention of always setting up, therefore, my own brand, mm -hmm. and my own company. And it's almost like you've just done three years of really hard work setting a company up and you've got to do it all again. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where we are now. Mm -hmm. Christmas number three now, just back to probably where I was, but with my own brand, mm -hmm. Team Festive. And then that's the brand that I'm going to grow for the future mm -hmm. and hopefully a different way to my competitors. As far as we know, we're the only Christmas decorating company based south of Edinburgh, north of York. It's quite an area of the country that would otherwise be without this profession mm -hmm. if we weren't here. So what are sort of some of your typical jobs or <laughs> you've got yeah. the examples? Oh, anything and everything. We decorate everything from porter cabins and fields mm -hmm. to your luxury manor houses, hunting lodges in the borders of Scotland mm -hmm. and everything in between. So people's terrace houses, people's mansion houses, cricket clubs, mm -hmm. golf clubs, airports, hospitals, city centres. Um, you know, really, if, if you if you imagine being a hotel manager of a five star hotel. Yeah. You're under quite a lot of pressure to deliver those Christmas rooms mm. Mm. at that, that five star service. Mm -hmm. You know, when have your staff got the capacity to come in on a Sunday night, you know, outside of their shifts and their hours, climb ladders that they may have been trained to use or may not have been trained to use, yeah. be insured to mm -hmm. do those things, mm -hmm. um, guarantee the work will be of a luxury standard for your luxury hotel. Mm -hmm. It's quite a problem. It is. Mm. It is a. It is a problem that we're solving for some people. Mm -hmm. um, so if you want to get on in your career as a hotel manager, you'll probably just say it's worth the investment yeah. in having a professional company come in and do this. Uh, and then you get all the great photographs one year that you can mm. then promote the year after. Yeah. So it's sort of so a long-term mm. approach that people have to take. Yeah. So staff are focusing on giving great service rather than. Do the baubles look in the right place on the tree? Mm -hmm. Do we have enough baubles or how do yes. we make this look good? Or mm. What did we do last year? Yeah, where's it? <laughs> we pull it out again. What does it look like? Oh, well, we've done it like that, so let's just keep doing it like that. It's a moment where actually that feeling of helplessness where you're given a task and you just think, I don't know how to do this. <laughs> you're, you're preventing people from giving that task to their staff because yes. you can do it and you can say with confidence that mm. we are professionals at doing this and I can guarantee the standard will be of a luxury standard. Yes, because how often have you worked in a company where it's like, right, who's doing the Christmas tree this year? And then mm -hmm. which stock cupboard is it in? Where did we put it? And then I'm sure we had green tinsel last Christmas. Mm -hmm. so <laughs> Nobody can find it. It's pulling it's pulling short shopping straws, again. Yeah. isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> but then where's the budget come from? Who's got the petty cash? Yeah. Mm. Who can sign it out? How much are we allowed to spend? Mm. And it's all got to be done like immediately because it's turned December and just the stress of it, you know, and <laughs> you're supposed to be meeting a client's deadline of your own or mm. finishing a task or getting other things done or it just it really does save the stress for a lot of people mm. so it's just not a lot of people know that we exist that's the main thing yeah talk us through your sort of typical year because you know you think christmas decoration you know, you're just getting busy in like november and december surely so what what does that look like for you uh, a lot of preparation mm -hmm. so there is a lot of christmas 2020 mm -hmm. so next year starts in January. It actually starts this week. I'm mm -hmm. meeting hotel managers this week to walk around their current decorations to talk about what can be improved for next year. Mm -hmm. And it's people we don't currently decorate for. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, the budgeting cycle, you know, whenever their year lands, they oh. need to be able to put a line in for Christmas decorations. Mm -hmm. yep. So they want to sit on a quote that's valid, mm -hmm. a long quote that's valid, um, mm -hmm. whilst they're doing that budgeting. Mm -hmm. um, and they can then have negotiations with us based on their budgeting process. Yep. This particular hotel I know budget in February. Mm -hmm. And so they want to walk around now because mm -hmm. then they've got January to prepare their budget, yep. February to get it approved. Mm -hmm. And then it's, it's a no-brainer. that They're already sat on a quote for next year and they can just say, yes, that part of our budget is yours. 
So it's some quite long lead stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a building maintenance company who deliver 110 Christmas trees to office receptions. Wow. And they've really struggled to do it professionally in a professional way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they put a tree out along with, you know, the potted plants they normally do. And they are experts at potted plants, planting interiors, green mm -hmm. walls, living walls. Mm -hmm. I would never dream of trying to create a living wall. Mm -hmm. I can't do it. It's not my expertise. Mm -hmm. um, but they are creating Christmas trees. And so they are sort of coming around to the idea of actually maybe we could get a professional in to do that part of mm. our contract with all these office blocks. Mm -hmm. And so that's another long lead thing. We met in January last year. Mm -hmm. They didn't go with us this year, this Christmas, because they approached us too late in the season when they were sort of going out to tender for their yep. what they call their delivery schedule. Mm -hmm. And I said to them, I'm not interested in your delivery schedule. I'm interested in decorating the trees and delivering the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So if you want me to take the whole problem off of you, fine. But yep. delivering your decor is not something my team can do because mm -hmm. we'd have to put our name to your work. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it wouldn't work professionally for me. So that's another thing. We're, we're in discussion with them about next Christmas already. And we go to exhibitions. Mm -hmm. So we exhibit mm -hmm. in January. And then we also go to exhibitions abroad where we purchase all the decorations from around the world. Mm -hmm. February then is, right, decide once you've come back from the exhibitions what you're actually going to buy. Mm -hmm of all the fantastic things that I get to see and mm. um, what's going to be on trend next year you know what's important what's on the horizon new inventions you know mm. lighting technology advances mm. every year and some amazing things that you see you might probably don't want to take the technology in its first year but you might do a sample mm -hmm. yep. um, which I've done this year on some technology and then the next year you might order big and yeah there's lots of city centre contracts that are out to tender about six million pounds in the UK each year mm -hmm. so choosing tender documents to apply for it takes a long time to apply mm. for those yep. a lot of research visits site visits measuring up you know there's a whole load of things that go into mm. to bidding for work so yeah just a lot of a lot of asking for work and <laughs> working with people who are willing to work with you and um, generally the larger the organization the earlier in the year they want to deal with it mm -hmm. so the you know the institutions like the nhs or international airports they'll want to deal with it earlier in the year and your smaller restaurants bars hotels they'll be happy to sort of deal with it later in the year mm -hmm. and the phone rings off the hook from september because people realize that it turned a bit cold <laughs> <laughs> christmas is the next big thing yeah and then so you're putting all the christmas trees up and doing all the decorations and then you have a, a little bit of a quiet time over christmas yeah and then all hell breaks loose halfway point christmas day <laughs> 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 yeah we have four days in january mm-hmm to take down the majority of things that we've put up over the last three months. Um, so I do get the fear, good at logistics, but that is a mm. significant logistical challenge spread across, you know, a geographical area from the middle of Scotland to the middle of England mm. where we're operating. Um, we do a couple of jobs in London as well. So yeah, it's a challenge. One, I'm still heavily sleep deprived and trying to work out in my head at the moment. So, <laughs> But then all that, I guess all the planning and the project management of that i guess that allows you to know how many elves you need to <laughs> take part in the operation and yeah and the great thing is we have a lot of repeat custom mm. so you have a lot of clients that you know or you've known some of our clients since the first year i decorated for them mm -hmm. seven years ago um i actually told them this year they were one of my first clients because i don't think they ever knew that but i, I told them mm -hmm. so we do have really lovely families whose homes we decorate mm -hmm. um companies whose office receptions are really important to them presentation of them yep. welfare of staff you know putting mm -hmm. a smile on people's faces mm. a lot of people who want to uh, increase the footfall mm -hmm. to their shops um so mm. they want archways garland archways outside yep. or ice cold lights on the building rows of shops and community groups that get together to decorate their their area so you know not official tenders but smaller groups of people who get together and fundraise mm -hmm. for the village christmas tree yep. you know uh, but they want someone who's going to be able to put it up and ensure that it's going to stay there and safely and mm. light it professionally so it looks really good okie dokie so i think james has uh, prepared some um <laughs> some interesting we've got a quick fire round which i think you've got a name for well, the festive quick fire round. <laughs> <laughs> we still need to work on the <laughs> something more it's sexy nothing. as a title <laughs> this one kind of relates to what you've just spoken about do you still love christmas yeah once absolutely. all the decorating's done and you have to take it down 
yeah I, I love I love Christmas all year round it's it's more the festive season for me so mm. the reason our company is called Team Festive you know yeah. rather than being specifically a Christmas decorating name yeah. was because whether your festivity is Hanukkah or Diwali or mm-hmm. Christmas mm-hmm. there is a festive season for you Mm. and Mm. we can decorate for any of those festive seasons it's not Mm. just christmas i mean i describe myself as a christmas decorator but really we're lighting installers Mm -hmm. so if you have a festival of lights then we can also decorate for that festival Mm. so um festivities wise i'm i'm a really enjoy events i really enjoy events i really enjoy something different you know when when there's a bar that pops up in a teepee and it's got fairy lights all over it doesn't it make you just want to go there Mm. just to try it it's not going to be there forever it's an event Mm. So those those kinds of things where we're going to be bringing people together at events, I think are going to become more important in the future, mm-hmm. where people have got social media and they can interact remotely with each other, but pulling people you know, off their sofas and out of their beds and into mm-hmm. events and spaces where they can experience something, mm-hmm. I think is really, really important for social interaction. Yeah. So Definitely. it sounds really daft, but us decorating and making those spaces really nice places to be Mm -hmm. is what will bring people to those events it might put a smile on your face on the way to work make you feel a bit better it would and that's what they say about the high street isn't it with the high street dying so to speak places need to have something that gives more of an experience Mm -hmm. if online shopping is more prevalent but if you say oh like we say in newcastle i'm going to go and see the phoenix window and we'll do a bit of christmas shopping experience you go in for the experience Mm -hmm. So I totally get that. Or you need to go and check out such and such a bar or restaurant because you won't believe what's in the window. Mm-hmm. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so I oh, totally buy that. On a Christmas tree, should tinsel or Christmas lights be the same color? Be the same color. So you'd only go for green tinsel or only go for red lights. We recommend decorating with three different colors Ooh, on a Christmas tree. Okay, that's tree. controversial. Top tip. <laughs> <laughs> so... Most importantly with lights, you just need enough of them. Yes. You don't want it to look stingy. The bottom half of the tree is missing. Yeah, lights. it's like you got, you got halfway <laughs> down and then run out. Yep. So make sure you have enough lighting. And then I would recommend three colours to decorate. So any three colours. You can use green as a colour. <laughs> look at thinking about mine. It's got about 40 different colours. <laughs> <laughs> it's lovely. It's lovely. <laughs> yeah, three different colours normally. Okay. Oh, that's that's interesting. Oh, I've learned something then. Now, so we, we were going to have a question about what are your top top three tips for christmas decorating so one is use three colors three colors what would be your other two have enough lighting but they can go as one tip if you like okay what would your other two top tips be then Um, enjoy it so have fun Mm. we create our best decorations when we've got a really nice team vibe going on in the workshop you know Mm. we've got the right kind of music on and you're with Mm -hmm. the right kind of people you're having a bit of a laugh maybe you're with your family you know Mm -hmm. and actually it's a family event Mm -hmm. so i would just say to people try to enjoy it you know if you don't enjoy it ask somebody else to do it Mm -hmm. that's why we come in you know if you (laughs) you don't enjoy it we do it (laughs) so (laughs) outsource yeah (laughs) so i think probably just enjoy what you're doing and um the third tip would probably be don't take it too seriously you know it's meant to be Mm. It's meant to be just enjoyable, fun, and whatever you end up with, whether it is a multicolored tree <laughs> or a professionally decorated trio of colors, yep. anything in between is acceptable. Mm-hmm. And anything you want to put up um, is mm-hmm. is what your Christmas is going to be. Yep. So, um, or your festivities, your mm. your celebration, whatever it is, like you know, what you choose to put up is is what is going to make your experience. So yes. enjoy it. Mm, I like that. Do you decorate your own home at Christmas or do you not have time? And if so, <laughs> is it simple or over the top? Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd say simple. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, when I, when I decorate my own home and I put trees up and I do it I do it to a luxury standard. I do, you know, if someone's coming in my house, they're going to expect to see something amazing. So, yes. you know, we put a luxury Christmas tree up. It's the full works. Mm-hmm. I can even get the team in to help me if I want to or do mm-hmm. it myself. What generally happens is that you know, someone will call me up last minute sort of a couple of weeks before Christmas or the week of Christmas and Mm -hmm. say, I've got a holiday home and it's just rented for the Christmas week, but we have no Christmas decorations in and all the shops are closing and, you Mm -hmm. know, there's no no decorations. I don't have time to sort the decorations out. Please can you just come and put a really lovely Christmas tree in there Mm -hmm. uh, for the week? Obviously, they've paid a premium because it's Christmas week. Sure. We've got the money. Please just bring the Christmas tree. Mm-hmm. And you, you kind of sat there, you know, <laughs> you stood the team down a little bit. You've maybe taken the van hire back for Christmas Day and you're kind of like, 
I've, I've got a black and gold tree <laughs> that you're looking at in your lounge. <laughs> Put and, some cling um, film on it, take yeah. it away. Yeah, so, you know, the, the best thing they could have is a luxury decorated tree that's had hundreds of hours of work put into it. And they can have it almost instantly if you sacrifice your own tree. Mm -hmm. So that has happened to me in the past and continues to happen. So (laughs) I say that it gets decorated, but it's how long it stays decorated for is probably the more important question. Do you have then a a favorite theme for Christmas? Like Scandinavian or snow theme or I don't know. Yeah, (laughs) well, yeah. that jumps to mind? Do you know, um, we do a candy-themed decoration, giant candy canes. Mm. And I mean giant, you know, these are meters, measured measured in meters, Mm -hmm. um, which is really, really fun Mm -hmm. at a restaurant in Scotland every year. Um, And they love it. And do you know what's really, really nice is we get to see their first guests come in for dinner. After we finish decorating, we stay for a meal and they all kind of walk in like, oh, oh, wow, you know, there's nothing like this. You know, you can't you can't create something that's so themed so well mm-hmm. on such a fast scale. They have mm-hmm. a vaulted ceiling and we suspend chandeliers of baubles in that ceiling. Mm. And so a strong theme, something like the candy theme is is really fun. That's just really fun. That's a good kind yep. of. Yeah, really nice, a bit different, unexpected, uh, strong theme. So I really enjoy projects like that. But then equally, when you have a really um, lavish budget, so when you have somebody who just says, you know, I've I've had people this year where I've said, did you have in mind how much you wanted to spend? And they kind of just look at you really confused (laughs) and say, no, anything. Go on. Go oh. mental. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that's a kind of a, a blank check, you know, to be yeah. able to say, well, okay, I'm going to make this amazing. Mm-hmm. So the other end of the spectrum is that, you know, uh, when it's sort of money, no object project, and mm. they also give you creative freedom. That's the thing about it is the creative freedom. It's being yes. able to say, I trust you and your yeah. judgment. These are my guidelines. This is my budget. Do what you do best. Yeah. So it's, I enjoy the projects the most where people give me creative freedom. Mm. Mm. to do what I do best. So. Would you come up with a like a vision board for someone? Or? Mood boards. Mood board, there's yeah. the term I'm looking for. Yeah, yeah. We do mood boards. So Fabulous. if people want, um, especially if they come to us earlier in the year, if you come to us in the middle of the busy season, so October, November time, <laughs> you get what a you're mood board might not happen <laughs> to you. Um, but if you came to us sort of July, August time, that's when we, we create a lot of mood boards and say, this is what mm-hmm. the Colour of Lightings do. We do CGIs as well, so you take photographs of people's houses, Cool. and digitally put the lights on that, and so you can see your house and whenever I've created a CGI for somebody mm. and showed them what the house will look like they have never not bought it because mm. like, you yeah. can see mm. what, what it's going to look like and mm-hmm. once you've got that image in your mind it's hard to unsee it unsee it yes. yeah so it's it's um That's fabulous. I think it is an amazing thing to do yeah uh, my last question do you think you have some elf DNA <laughs> Um, I'm a 16th Norwegian. Yeah, well, there we go. Then. We're getting there up towards the Arctic <laughs> Circle, there, aren't we? Yeah, and no, I know that I know that I've got Norwegian in me. <laughs> so Scandinavian, maybe, and uh, it's on the way to Lapland, isn't it? So yeah, I knew yes, it. <laughs> yes, I do. Do you have pointy ears as well? <laughs> I'm hiding them. At ah, the moment. that's why you've got long hair. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That was my last best of by a quick by a question. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. So, Laura. If you had to go back to your 18-year-old self and give her some advice, what would that advice be? Um, Keep doing the things that you love. Mm -hmm. Stick with the things that you enjoy and let go the things that you don't. Mm -hmm. And it will be good guidance for you for the future because you will be enjoying more of the things that you do than the things that you don't want to do. And I've only ever chosen to do things that were fun. Mm-hmm. That's a kind of guiding principle. Mm-hmm. So even if it was voluntary work, which has helped me grow as a person, mm-hmm. um, I've always enjoyed them mm. or thought that I was going to enjoy them before mm. I did them. And certainly Christmas decorating is a whole load of fun. <laughs> so if you enjoy what you do, I think people in life hope for, you know, uh, a relationship with the person they love, maybe to buy the house they've always wanted or to have the job of their dreams, you know. And I have the latter. I'm working on the two, but I have <laughs> the latter. I have the job of my dreams. Mm. This is definitely something that I want to do for the whole of my career. And I love doing it. So if you have a passion for something, people can tell, you know, you kind of radiate that passion. Mm-hmm. And that's what's most important is, you know, if it's 
education, something you're studying, choose something you enjoy. If it's a voluntary role that you want to do because it looks interesting or fun, or you're going to learn from it, do it. If you are looking for your dream job, mm-hmm. do something you enjoy. Mm-hmm. And it might not, you know, every day at 5 a.m. in the pouring rain, freezing cold, be the best moment of your life. But on the whole, when you see mm-hmm. what you've achieved, you know, and what you've given to other people mm-hmm. um, through your work, hopefully you feel that you've, you know, made the world a better place in some way. So mm-hmm. That's wonderful. Thank you ever so much. So if somebody likes the sound of you and is interested in your story and wants to hire you to decorate their houses or mansions <laughs> or, you know, lodges or retreats or whatever, how is the best way of contacting you I, what is the best yeah. visit our website which is teamfestive.com mm-hmm. um, which has all our contact details and um, it has a portfolio of images so it's quite a simple website but it's designed as a portfolio an example of what we've done in the past mm. and things that we can do in the future are endless mm-hmm. so if you have something that's not in our portfolio that you want us to do um, we can definitely do that your imagination is your limit I think exciting yeah, very exciting it's got me thinking <laughs> my festive socks on <laughs> festive jumper yeah. yes what's next <laughs> well thank you ever so much for coming to visit well, thank you for having me Excellent. and i hope okay. everyone has a lovely festive season oh, yes yeah. happy thank festive you. season yeah <laughs> thank you thanks everyone for listening check out all the show notes at inspirationnorth.com Join us again for the next episode when we'll be chatting to another inspirational person. If you like this, subscribe and tell your friends. If you didn't like this, subscribe anyway and tell everybody.